are coming to the end of a series called Victorious. And we have been focusing on the victory of Jesus. And if you pay attention, you will see the victory of Jesus all over the place. In any given day, just keep your eyes open, pay attention. I saw it this morning, right here, about a minute and a half ago, as we were worshiping together. Cole, who's our normal worship leader, is we give them a couple weeks off a year. We actually do that. And so uh, we had three women from our congregation, all volunteers from our women, using their voices to glorify God. And one of our worship leaders today was 14 years old. That's victory, right? I mean, that's, and that, that's the church. I mean, that's the, just people using their gifts. That's the victory of Jesus Christ. So as we walk through life, there's all kinds of victories when we pay attention. And here's the reality. Uh, some victories are better than others. Some victories are little victories. Some are big victories. Like, have you, how many of you ever played Monopoly? Or Settlers of Catan or Risk or any kind of board game, right? You get together with some friends or family. If, you know, it takes hours if somebody doesn't get upset and flip the board over or something. But you, know, you, you, know, you, you play for hours, maybe for a whole afternoon on a Saturday or from an evening. And you finish and you go, I got boardwalk. I got park place. I got the railroads. People don't even need the railroads. But you know, I, I got it all. What a victory, right? And when it's all done, what do you do? You put it back in the box. <laughs> victory over. It's a, short, it's a short-term victory. Some of you now, or maybe when you were kids, uh, competed in sports. I swam for four years on a swim team from like third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And when we swam, when I was a kid and we swam on a swim team, they had, they had this, first, second, third prize. They were ribbons, first, second. Now they got fourth, fifth, sixth. This is a medallion that says 99th place. Um, 999th place, uh, honorable mention, nice try. Um, <laughs> But it's, it's a different world, right? But, but you, even when you win those things, it's a victory. But can I tell you right now, I don't have any of my swim team ribbons from fourth grade hanging in my office here at church. If I did, it'd be kind of sad. Um, <laughs> I'm living in fourth grade still, right? That's a victory, but it's a victory for a week or so. Maybe you played on a high school or college sports team, and you won like a, a state championship. Okay, you know, maybe you played football and, you, and, your, and your team won a, a state championship in football. You go, man, you're going to remember that the rest of your life. As a matter of fact, if people will ask you questions, you'd be glad to talk about it. Oh, back when I was in high school. And, and there's stories to be you know, That's a victory that can last a lifetime. National championships of sports teams, they go in the record books. And they're there for all of human history to look back and say, who won the World Series? Who won the playoffs? And it's there for, even if people don't remember, they can go back, it's there. So that's, that's a, quite a victory. But the victory we're going to talk about today is a victory that if you know this victory, if you receive this victory, the victory of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection, his ascension, his presence and power right now, if you walk in victory of Jesus, listen to this, it will impact every day of the rest of your life. Every relationship, every choice you make, everything you do will be impacted by the victory of Jesus, and it will impact you for all of eternity. That's a victory. That's worth celebrating. Some victories are bigger than others, and the victory of Jesus Christ, there is nothing bigger, nothing more amazing, nothing more incredible. And, and so I want to invite you today, as we talk about the victory of Jesus Christ, as we finish up the sixth message series on being, being victorious, we're going to talk about what, how do you walk in that victory? How do you first walk into it to receive the victory? And how do you live in that? And here's what I want to pray for. I want to pray that if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're in one of our venues, if you're at home or traveling somewhere and following online, if you're here in the worship center, and this group, thank you for joining us indoors. Usually this is an outdoor service, but the weather's not really permitting that today. But, but wherever you are, if you have come to the cross and received Jesus Christ, here's my prayer for you today. You will hear, we're going to look at three passages of Scripture. John 14, John 3, Romans 10. And we're going to talk about this victory of Jesus. Here's my prayer for you if you're a Christian. That you will understand the greatness of the victory of Jesus deeper than you ever have before. And you will understand it with such clarity that when somebody comes along and says, oh, you're a Christian, right? Well, uh, tell, how, how, what, how does that work? How do you become a Christian? How does that work? You'll be able to say, I can tell you. John 14, John 3, Romans 10. And you can share that victory with someone else. I hope that you get prepared if you're a believer. And, and, and be impassioned to walk in that victory. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, if you're in one of our venues, if you're at home, or if you're here in the worship center, and you say today, I'm not a Christian yet. Or, or you, you say, I'm 
not sure. I don't know for sure that I've come to the cross and received Jesus. I'm going to pray that this will be the day that you understand that victory with such clarity, you say, I want to step into that victory. So Jesus, this is our prayer. As we begin to open your word, as we think about your victory that you offer to us that can become our victory, for all who are listening, who are already Christians, who are walking that victory, who've come to the cross, who know you, Jesus, may we be impassioned to live for you with greater commitment, and may we be prepared to share this victorious good news of who you are and what you've done and this victory that can impact every day of our life, every moment of our life for all of eternity. And Lord, we pray for anyone who's listening today, wherever they are, if they have not yet come to that place where they've accepted the victory of Jesus, Lord, may this be the day. Speak to their hearts as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 14, whether you're on a Bible app, whether you have a paper Bible, or we'll have some of the passages up on the screen. But we're going to walk through these three passages, and we're going to really dig into what is this victory of Jesus, and how do we, how do we receive this victory and live in it? So, how do you receive the victory of Jesus? Here's the first thing from John 14. Take the one way. Take the one way to God through Jesus Christ. Look with me at John chapter 14. And Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's with his closest followers. And he's talking to them about heaven, about eternity. So John 14, beginning in verse 1, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Listen to this. My Father's house has many rooms. He's using human language to talk about heaven. He's saying, My Father's house has many rooms. And I love this. If that were not so... Would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Don't you love that? Jesus, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. And then Jesus says, you you know, you've been with me a long time. You've heard a lot of my teachings. So you know the way to the place where I am going. He says, you know it by now. But apparently Thomas didn't totally get it yet. Because look, look what happens in the next verse, verse five. Thomas said to him, Lord, We don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? He says, I don't don't fully understand. Look at verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those are bold words. They're clear. They're precise. They're unapologetic. And so you read those words, and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. As you look at this passage, it's it's a powerful passage. Talking about heaven, Jesus is talking about eternity. And he's saying, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to heaven, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So that where I am, you can be there too. When I read Jesus saying, I'm going to go prepare a place for you, I think of that picture of Jesus going ahead of us and preparing this place of glory. But when I think about a person preparing for company... I think of Sherry Harney, my wife. When we're going to have company over at our house, she starts getting prepared. I mean, our, our house, it's, I look and go, it's clean already. But she's like, oh, we got company, you know, and it's going to get cleaner. And if we have guests that are going to stay in our guest room, there's, there's going to be clean sheets. I mean, not just clean, but new clean sheets. There's going to be a bottle of water next to each of the, on each side of the bed because you should hydrate. And we want to make sure if you have company, they, they can hydrate. And there's going to be, and she's going to go shopping. I, I can look and go, we got all kinds of stuff. She, she's gonna, because here's what's going to happen. Every morning, she's preparing a place. Everybody follow me? Every morning, when people get up at our house and you come as a guest, there's going to be a little buffet breakfast there. If somebody says, oh, I don't, I'm not a really breakfast person, that's fine. It's going to be there. And there's going to be two or three or four options because options, my wife loves options. She loves, to, she loves to share options with people. She prepares a place. Now, can I tell you something? When Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, for you, for you. As good as a job as my wife does in getting prepared, it's better than that by infinity. Jesus says, I have gone to prepare a place for you and the glory and the beauty that, that, <clears throat> that awaits all who put their faith in Jesus is beyond our comprehension. Jesus, I'm gonna, Jesus, I'm gonna go prepare a place. And then Thomas says, but we don't... We don't know where you're going, so how are we going to get there? And Jesus says these words. 
these powerful words, and, he, and he, he says them with clarity and precision. I am the way. Thomas says, what's, well, what's the way to get there, to this place where you're preparing a place to heaven? He, Jesus, I am the way and the truth and the life. But he doesn't stop there. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus was absolutely emphatic that there is one way to heaven, and it's him. So here's the question. And, and, and you talk, some people don't like that statement of Jesus. Some Christians don't like that statement of Jesus. It bothers them. It feels so exclusive, so narrow. So here's the question. <clears throat> Is Jesus being mean-spirited or infinitely kind? When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Is he being mean-spirited or is he being kind? And here's, here's, here's the, what determines it. It depends on if he's telling the truth. If there's lot, if any way, and some people say, well, any way will get you to God. If there's lots of ways or any way, then Jesus is being mean-spirited. But if, if there was no way for human beings to get back to God in their own power, if there was no way, and Jesus came and made a way for everyone who would believe, if Jesus came and offered a way, when, when there, if there was no way to get back to God with our own good works, with our own good efforts, no way to get home again, and Jesus came and made a way that anyone and everyone could accept, and he says, I am the way, the truth, life, then he's being infinitely kind. And what the Bible teaches is Jesus is saying what's absolutely true. There was no way to get back home again. And Jesus gave his life. He became the way to heaven. And he offers it to everyone. That's infinitely kind. Uh, Sherry and I, uh, just a couple weeks ago, she had, seen this, she had seen this guy who was sharing a testimony. He was an atheist, and through this experience he had, he became a deeply committed Christian. And the experience was that he was uh, somewhere off, uh, not Australia, but somewhere in that part of the world, and he was swimming in the water, and he was uh, stung by a box jellyfish. Since then, I've studied box jellyfish because I didn't know much about them. And he wasn't just stung once, he was stung five times. Their tentacles are 10 feet long, and, and if you get stung by them, you can die in two to five minutes, depending on how much venom gets in your system. Their tentacles actually have spikes on them. And this guy wasn't stung by one box of jellyfish. He was stung by five of them. And his, his name, you can look this up, his name was Ian McCormick. Ian McCormick. And he, uh, he died. They put him on a slab for 15 minutes. And then he wasn't dead anymore. And he became a follower of Jesus. Fascinating story. So I, I got studying this. I got thinking about that idea of box jellyfish. So I want to tell you a little scenario, and I'm going to put you in the story, okay? Someone sends you on an all-paid vacation to Australia, because that's kind of the, where these things are, right? So yeah, I, I got to get you there, okay, in the story here, okay? So you're there, and the first day you get there, you go, oh, you, you see this beautiful kind of water. It's blue. It's nice and warm. And so you go jump in the water, and while you're in the water, box jellyfish comes along, and you go, you know, dra drags across your legs and your side, and just venom's going through your body. So you, you get yourself out of the water as fast as you can, you, and you go right to a lifeguard. And you say to the lifeguard, I was stung by this giant, kind of like boxy-shaped thing with these long tentacles, and they go, box jellyfish, and, they go, and, it, and, it's and you can see all these spots where it's turning red, and, and I feel like I'm dying. I feel like I'm dying. Now, I want you to imagine something. That lifeguard has the antivenom for the box jellyfish up in his lifeguard stand. But he says to you, well, I don't want to be too particular. You know, there's some things you could do. Uh, maybe you get some butter and rub it on that when you get home. Rub some butter on that. You'll try that. Maybe spray some Windex. I hear that's really good on dry skin and different things. And was that? Uh, there was a movie where everything was Windex. Um, you know, maybe do some Windex. Maybe it says, you know, if you just take a nap. Take a nap and see if you ever wake up. Oh, and, and also I got this antivenom up in my lifeguard stand. In the time he's doing that, you could die. Is that kind? Is it kind to offer lots of other options when there's only one antivenom that, that will save your life? No. The kindest thing is for him to go, wait, and run as fast as he can, grab the antivenom, come back, and get it in your system. This is what Jesus is doing. He doesn't say, well, there might be a lot of... He knows that, he knows that there was no way for human beings to get home. He knows that he is going to make the only way. So he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but me. Why? Because there's no other way. And to pretend like there is, is infinitely unkind. To tell what that way is, is the best thing you can do. That's what Jesus is doing. And so as we talk about this good news of Jesus, salvation found in his name, we have to understand that we can take the one way to God through faith in Jesus Christ.
Second passage. Let's look at John chapter 3. And I hope you can lock these away in your mind, even in the front of your Bible, write down you know, John 14, John 3, Romans 10. You can walk someone through this. After I've taught this once, you can remember it enough to share the simple message with other people. John 3, beginning in verse 1. Now, what we hear is this. You must be born again by looking to the Son. Not S-U-N, but S-O-N. You have to be born again by looking to Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. In John 3, Jesus is talking with a man who is a religious leader, very spiritual, very religious. We all know people who are very spiritual and very religious, but they don't believe in Jesus. And that's what Nicodemus was like. So let's pick this up at verse 1. John 3, 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He wasn't just a Pharisee. He wasn't just a religious leader. He was a member of the Jewish Supreme Court in Jerusalem. This guy's a big deal. Highly educated. He knows the Bible well. He came to Jesus at night. That at night in the, in the original language could be interpreted under the cloak or cover of night. He didn't want to be seen because the, they had some problems with Jesus, like Jesus claiming to be the Messiah and the Savior, stuff like that. And so the religious leaders were, were apprehensive. So he came at night and he said, Rabbi, to Jesus, he calls him Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. He says, we, we hear about your miracles. We hear about all you're doing. So God's got to be with you. So now watch the conversation. This guy comes and says, hey, we know that you're a teacher come from God. How do you respond to that? Well, thank you for the kind words. Nice to meet you. No, no, look how Jesus responds in verse three. Jesus replied, very truly, that's the amen, amen, verily, verily, very, this is strong. He says, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. What? <laughs> that wasn't the flow of the conversation. <laughs> I mean, Nicodemus is coming up and saying, hey, we hear great things about you, and you know, just kind of easing in. And Jesus just looks at him and just, this is called cutting to the chase, getting to the point. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Now, Nicodemus, being a rabbi, being a religious teacher, loved debate and discussion. Sherry and I got to be in Jerusalem at the Wailing Wall where they have scrolls and rabbis debating the scriptures and there's a certain area that you can go as, as kind of a guest there and then there's other areas that are kind of reserved for the rabbis and I mean, they're arguing, they're debating, they're going, and you can tell that they love it. They love you know, debating. Well, that's what you know, Nicodemus is talking to another rabbi so he's going to get rabbinical. He's going to have a little debate with him and have some fun with this. So he, G, uh, Nicodemus says to Jesus, verse four, how can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. See, he, he's playing rabbinical games here. He's saying, uh, Jesus, I'm a lot bigger than I was when I was first born. You're not telling me, are you telling me I got to, you know, <laughs> climb back in my mom, be born again? What are you saying here, right? And Jesus gets right back to the point. Verse 5, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you. No one can enter the kingdom of God. He gets back to spiritual things. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water. Mother's water breaks, born physically, right? Physical birth. And of the spirit, a spiritual birth. He said to Nicodemus, you've been born physically. You're very religious, but you have not been born spiritually. And you need to be born again. Verse six. Flesh gives birth to flesh. We have a physical birth. And the spirit, uh, uh, flesh gives birth to but the spirit gives birth to the spirit, to, to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you do, cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. What's he saying? You've had a physical birth, but you need a spiritual birth. You know, Nicodemus is, is thinking, man, I'm as religious as they get. I'm as spiritual as you can be. I'm a religious leader. Yeah, but he didn't know Jesus. There's a difference between having religion and knowing Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying, you must be born again. You must start this whole new life, this whole new beginning. And this happens as Jesus goes on to teach in verses 14 and 15. He says, by looking to the Son. You look to the Son. You put your faith in him. What we know from Scripture is that Nicodemus becomes a follower of Jesus. He becomes born again. He recognizes, though for all my life I've been religious, in a sense been waiting for the Messiah, what he realized is the Messiah was standing right in front of him. And he put his faith in Jesus Christ. Recognize it's not about being spiritual. It's about being a follower of Jesus, placing our faith in him. And then the third passage we're going to look at today, Romans chapter 10. 
And in Romans chapter 10 uh, is this great, and, and the whole chapter kind of walks through this theme. We're going to look at just the first two verses of Romans 10, and then we're going to jump down to verses 9 and 10. But I want you to get the heart of Paul as he's talking about the people he loves and cares about that he wants to know Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior. Look with me at Romans 10.1. Brothers and sisters, listen to this. My heart's desire and prayer to God is for the, Isra- for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Here's what Paul says. And you have to understand, Paul is of Jewish descent. Those are his, those are his people. And he says, it is my heart's desire that my people would know Jesus. If you're a Christian... Let me ask you a question. Who are your people? Who are the people you love that don't know Jesus? Is it your heart's desire that your child who's wandering would know Jesus? That your siblings that don't put faith in Jesus, you you say, man, they're my people, they're my family. It's my heart's desire that they would know Jesus. Maybe it's people at work who become friends, they become your family in the workplace, and you go, it is my heart's desire that they would know Jesus. And so Paul is saying, this is my heart's desire. Now I want to let you know how you come and put your faith in Jesus Christ. So we go down to verse 9. And he's continued teaching on this, but in verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. That word Lord means ruler. He's the boss. He's in charge. He is the leader of my life. Part, see, part of becoming a Christian is surrender. Jesus is Lord means he's now in charge of my life. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We declare with our mouths, he's going to rule our lives, he's our Lord, but we believe in our hearts that Jesus came from the heaven, God with us. He died on the cross for our sins, paid the price. He rose again in glory, and he ascended to heaven, and he's there right now preparing a place for us, interceding for us, working on our behalf. Verse 10 says this, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now listen to verse 11. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. No more shame. For there is no difference between Jews and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Look at verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be be saved. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord. Why? Because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. Because being born again happens through looking to the Son, looking to Jesus Christ. John 14, John 3, Romans 10. If you're a Christian, get those in your heart and your mind. Because that tells the story of our salvation and the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul, Paul is, is trying to help us understand this is what Jesus has done. This is who he is. We want to walk and live in the victory of Jesus Christ. How do you do that? Well, you you know. You do it through Jesus. By having new life and new birth in his name. And, And that happens when you believe in your heart what the Bible teaches about him and you profess with your lips. So I want to give an invitation today to the victorious life and eternal life offered by Jesus. I want, I want to invite every, every single person here today who's gathered in the worship center, who's on our campus somewhere in one of the venues, or who's online, to do one of two things. To either say, Jesus, I already believe in you, but I want to be so aware of your good news and the victory of you, that you've given me that I, I'm ready to share it with others, that I could say, who are those people who are family to me, who I care about, who I love, and my heart longs for them to be saved? And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, an opportunity to say, I'm ready. This is my day to put my faith in Jesus. So how do you do this? You accept Jesus, not as a way to heaven, but as the way to heaven. And again, that is not mean-spirited. If it's true, it's the most loving thing you could do is that Jesus came and gave his life to save us. That's God's gift of grace. We've got to look to the Son and say, I need a new life. I was born once physically, but I've got to be born of the Spirit, and I'm ready to do that. You've got to understand that you trust in the righteousness of Jesus, not your own good works. We're not saved by how good we are, not one of us. None of us measure up. We're saved by the grace of God given in Jesus Christ. And then we embrace his leadership and we walk in his resurrection power. I've got a friend that I uh, golf with occasionally 
And uh, oftentimes when I golf with him, he'll invite his dad to golf with us. And uh, this, this friend of mine is older than me, and so his dad is about 25 years older than him. So his dad, when I first got to know him, was in his 80s. I actually got to saw his dad get his first ever hole-in-one when we were golfing once in his 80s, which is kind of cool. But I saw something even cooler happen, something even better happen. We would talk about faith. And this friend of mine's dad kind of been around church, been around religion a bit. His wife passed away some years ago. And I got talking to him about his wife. And, and, and every time he talks to her, there's still a tenderness in his heart about his wife who's gone. And, and he, said, he said to me, he said, yeah, I know, I know that she's in heaven right now. Because she was an angel. She was such a good person. And I said to him, well, do you believe you'll be in heaven? He said, oh, I've not been any angel. I don't think so. What's he thinking? Heaven's based on how good you are. My wife's been good. I'm not, I, I compare myself to her. I'm not, so she's probably in heaven. I'm probably not. So we talked when we were golfing. I said, you know, I said, do you believe that that's the way to heaven? Because see, what Jesus, what Jesus is saying is he's the way, the truth, and the life. Look to the Son and be saved. Be born again, but it doesn't talk about how good you are. It talks about how good Jesus is. So I had this conversation with him. And the next couple of times we'd go off, about every four, six, seven weeks I'd see him. And I'd ask him every time, and just, you know, not being a buggy pastor, just being a buggy person, I guess. But uh, I would just say to him, hey, I'd say to him, where are you at with the whole Jesus thing? Do you, do you understand? Because we walked through the gospel, and he kept, you know, he kept saying, well, but I do a lot of stuff I shouldn't do, or I, you know, and he just, my past, and he had these reasons, all based on himself. And so, and so one time uh, when we were together, I, I asked him again. And he said, I've been thinking about it. And he said, it's not about how good I am. It's not about what I've done. If it's just about Jesus and what he's done, if I believe in him, then, then I'm going to heaven. And I said, and the clouds parted and the angels went, ooh. No, but it was like, it was like oh my gosh. You know, he, had that, he, he got it. And we actually stood on, he was on the 14th green uh, at Poppy Hills Golf Course and prayed together. As this guy said, I finally get it. I'm praying for some people today. It's the day that you go, I finally get it. It's not how good I am compared to somebody else. It's not how good I am at all. It's about how good Jesus is. And there was no way home until Jesus came and made a way. And I can put my faith in him and be born again and start a new life. That's what Jesus wants to do. That's how Jesus wants to work in your life. And so here's what I want to do. I want to pray together. And I want to invite you, whether you're here in the worship center or whether you're online or in one of the other venues, to, to join me in prayer. And I'm going to lift up two different prayers. One for people that have already put their faith in Jesus and one for people who want to put their faith in Jesus. And I'm not going to have like quiet music in the background. I'm not going to drag it out and try to pressure anybody because I can't pressure anybody. But if your heart right now is saying, I'm not 100% sure and I want to know that I know Jesus, I would encourage you to make this the day. Will you join me in prayer? Let's bow our heads together. And I want to ask first, I'm going to ask for a response and I want to pray for, for, for you that have put your faith in Jesus. If you have come to the cross and put your faith in Jesus, whether it was 50 years ago or two weeks ago, if you know that you've put your faith in Jesus, you've accepted his grace, you believe in your heart, you've confessed with your lips, you know you are a Christian. And you are ready to pray with me to be able to understand in deeper ways the victory of Jesus and how to live in it and how to share it with others. If you want that prayer, raise your hand and raise it high. I want to see you just say, I am a Christian. I know the victory of Jesus. But I want, today I want to say, Jesus, I am ready to walk and live in that victory in a deeper way. Okay. Okay, put your hands down, but keep your heart lifted up, okay? Dear Jesus, right now I pray with all those in the worship venues at home right now or wherever they are online and right here in the worship center who raise their hand whose hearts are lifted up saying, Jesus, thank you that you have saved me. Thank you that you paid the price. Thank you, Jesus, that when there was no way, you won the victory over sin and death and hell, and you opened the way to heaven, and you've gone to prepare a place for me. I thank you, Jesus. Let me walk in the power of your resurrection and in your victory all the days of my life and for all of eternity. But will you also join in this prayer? Will you say, oh God, like the Apostle Paul said, I long that my people would know Jesus as Messiah, as Savior. Would you say to him right now, Jesus, there are people that are my people, my friends, my neighbors, family members, people I love that don't know you. I pray you would open their hearts, their, turn their eyes to see you, Jesus, the only Son, the only Savior. And I dare to pray right now that, God, you will give me courage to pray for them, to love them, and when the moment comes, to share the story 
of who you are and what you've done and your victory in my life in a way that they can understand and maybe they can open their hearts to follow Jesus. If you prayed that prayer right now, as Christians, God hears your prayer. And he's going to give you a deeper burden for people that, are, that don't know him yet. And he's going to give you opportunities to talk about your faith and to share about him. Be prepared for that adventure that lies ahead. And next I want to ask you, if you say today, whether you're at home or one of our venues or here in the worship center, I want to ask you, if you want to say today, I'm not 100% sure I'm a Christian. I don't, I'm not positive I put my faith in Jesus, but I'm ready. I get the message. I want to be born again. I want to look to the Son and be saved. I want his righteousness to become my righteousness. You say, I want to be a Christian today. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand if you're at home, if you're in the worship center, in the ven venues, just raise your hand up high because I want to pray for you. So if you say, I want to pray right now to put my faith in Jesus. Okay. Yeah, good. Anybody else? And God sees you. If it's, you're in a dark spot in the worship center and I can't see you, God can see you. And if you're somewhere else and your hand is raised, God sees your hand. So now put your hand down, but keep your heart lifted up. And if this is you today, or if you didn't feel comfortable raising your hand, but you want to pray this prayer, please join in because God will hear you. Will you say, oh, dear God, today is the day. I put my faith in Jesus. I declare that he is now the Lord, the leader of my life. I believe in my heart that Jesus, you came to this world to save me. I believe in my heart that you died on the cross for me, for my sins. I believe, Jesus, that you rose again, bringing victory for me. And Jesus, I believe that right now you're preparing a place for me so that where you are, I can be with you someday. So I confess all my sins and I give them to you. And I take all of my life and I put it in your hands. And I say, Jesus, lead me and guide me. Let me walk in your victory all the days of this life and forever and ever and ever. Jesus, we all thank you for the privilege of being together like this and pray that you will hear our hearts and remind us of your victory every single moment of every single day until we see you face to face and forevermore. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you, if you prayed that prayer, if you are online, I want to challenge you. You're going to see a number right now on your screen. Just text the word victory. Just go to that, to that number and text the word victory. And we will follow up with you because we want to give you uh, a, a nice new Bible here. We've got these great Bibles. We want to get some information from you. We've got a great little devotional book and a 50-day Bible reading plan and some things about growing in faith. If you put your faith in Jesus, it's not the end of the deal right now. This is the start of a new relationship. And if you're here on campus in either of our venues or here in the worship center and you raise your hand and you're ready to have a conversation about next steps of growing in faith, my wife Sherry and I are going to be right here by these stairs and we want to give you one of these Bibles and these packets and just pray with you and celebrate with you, but also open the door to help you walk and grow in your Christian life. And so I want to just uh, celebrate the fact that God is touching hearts and lives. I want to give two other invitations before I invite you to stand for a closing word of blessing. If you need prayer, if you're here on our campus and you need prayer, we're going to have a team right up here, right where Pastor Dennis is right now and along the wall there. They would love to pray with you for whatever's on your heart, whatever's in your life. Let them pray for you. If you're online, uh, you're going to see online, there's a phone number you can call, and we have uh, people waiting right now on that line to pray with you, or you can just email in at the email address your specific prayer need, and we'll put it on a list. And we have a great team of prayer people, and I'll say to all of you, if you are, have a passion for prayer, contact the church this week and say, put me on the prayer list, because every week we'll send you prayer needs for the congregation. You can join us in prayer for those people. And so send your prayers into us right now. And then if you're new at Shoreline, if you're new and you're online, Will you text the word welcome to the number you see on the screen? Just text the word welcome, and we will follow up and get to know you as best we can online. We want to come alongside of you and encourage you uh, as you as you become part of Shoreline Church. And if you're here in the worship center or on campus and you're new, before you leave, on your way out, just go through the lobby, and on the right is our connection center. They want to give you a gift. Thank you for coming. Answer any questions you have. Just give you a warm, personal welcome. So see them on your way out. Uh, that's all the announcements. I want to invite you to stand with me. And if you're here in the worship center, on, in the venues, please, please feel free to stand. If you're at home, feel free to stand and receive a word. If you're able to, stand and receive a word of blessing. 
And my wife Sherry and I will be up here for about five or ten minutes to talk with folks that say, hey, I'm, I've taken that step. Or maybe you had a couple of questions. You say, I think I'm ready to receive Jesus. But a couple of questions, come and tell us. We'll pray with you, talk with you, and answer your questions. As you go from this place, may you experience the victory of Jesus Christ. May you know that he loves you so much that he came to this world. He gave his life for you. He died in your place for your sins, and he rose again in authority and power. And he's gone to prepare a place for you. And for all who put their faith in him, walk in his victory. Walk in his power. And just experience all he does in and through you. And one last word. If you weren't ready to say yes to Jesus today, and you're not a Christian, keep coming to Shoreline. We'll walk with you. We'll be patient. Because when that day comes, we're here for you. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you back hopefully next week outdoors at 11 o'clock or inside at 9 o'clock. God bless you. Have a great day.